Okay, it should be live. Hey guys, sorry about the delay. We were working on getting the world's most interesting startup guys on, or at least a couple of them. I'm Matt Ward. I'm your host. This is Coral TV. We get the smartest folks when it comes to crypto startups, business, and building awesome shit on. And we uh, we go into breaking down businesses, building them up bigger. Today we've got three interesting startup guys. We got Andrew Ackerman, director over at Dreamit, one of the top accelerators. We got Ben Gilbert. He runs Pioneer Square Labs, uh, a pretty sizable at this point venture studio and the acquired podcast, which if you haven't checked it out, is definitely worth a listen. And we've got Chad Rubin. He runs Cubana and a massive e-commerce company. Not massive, but massive for most folks that haven't taken funding up to, I think, eight figures at this point. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves in a sec because introductions are incredibly challenging. But today we're going to see what everyone can bring to the table. Everyone generally speaking, that's listening to this has a business and they want to build it bigger. And here are three, three of the best. So yeah, welcome to the program, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So the introductions are intentionally designed to be horrible so that you can elaborate a little bit. So <laughs> take, a, take a minute or two just to talk to people about who you are, how you got here, what your skill set is. We'll go left to right. Uh, I guess that means Ben. Guess All right. So I'm, I'm Ben Gilbert uh, up in Seattle, Washington. I'm the co-founder of Pioneer Square Labs. We are a startup studio and uh, venture fund, more recently a, a venture fund as well. And so the way that the startup studio model works is really as opposed to kind of the either traditional venture capital model or the accelerator model where sort of do batches of companies that um, can benefit from um, being a part of sort of a guided program. The studio model is really around, can we sort of hand assemble companies from scratch? So there's 25 folks that work here, largely engineers, designers, um, there's business analysts, operations folks, um, digital marketers, basically all the ingredients you would need in an early stage startup. And we sort of concept test um, four to six different ideas in parallel at any given time, just kind of inside the studio. We kill about nine out of 10. So we've worked on 120 ideas or something like that and spun out 11 into venture backed companies. And when they're starting to seem like, gosh, this could actually, you know, this has a little bit of, uh, of legs to it, um, we find sort of the, the right people to really partner with who are going to be the true founders of that company um, and come in and, and sort of spin it out to them and work with them for a period of time to um, kind of be their, their team until they hire up the full team and, and help raise money and all that. So um, PSL by the numbers is uh, we've raised $27 million for the studio. Um, we're an $80 million early stage venture fund uh, focused on the Pacific Northwest. Spun out 11 companies, uh, invested directly in, in one from the, the venture side, um, and we're about three years old. Quite and an active three years. Chad? <laughs> yeah, hey everybody. Uh, Chad Rubin here. Uh, let's see. I went to school at UMass Amherst. I came from a family where we had nothing, so I really I studied finance. Went on to Wall Street covering internet stocks. Um, helped my parents get on the internet. Uh, when Al Gore invented the internet, and uh, we started selling vacuum parts online, and then I started deploying resources into creating my own brand on Amazon, along with on all these other channels. Uh, it's called Think Crucial or Crucial Vacuum. Uh, it's an eight-figure business now uh, with one employee, all automated with a software that we built called Scubana, uh, which is a pretty much bootstrap business. Uh, we raised about $880,000 four years ago uh, and haven't raised a dime since, which should be good and bad. Uh, and I'm happy to share that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now we're up to about 28 people, and I'm talking to you live from Soho, New York, in a telephone booth. <laughs> so I, I'm also, I'm Andrew Ackerman. I'm also in a telephone booth. We're both in WeWorks, if you can't tell from the background. Uh, I'm a Dream It. Uh, I don't, I'm not wearing my, my Dream It t shirt and hat, so I apologize. Uh, probably should have thought ahead like that, Chad. Uh, Dream It is a venture fund and an accelerator. I say that, and usually people are like, oh, you're a venture fund. We're known for everything that we do in the accelerator space. But basically, we our third fund's a $50 million fund, uh, and everything that we do on the accelerator side is how we feed that fund. Uh, we currently work in three verticals, uh, health tech, which we've been doing continuously since 2013, uh, urban tech, which I run, so that includes real estate, construction, and parts of smart city. We've been doing that for over two years, and we just launched a secure tech track, which deals with uh, cybersecurity, but also physical security 
and what we're calling social security, like fake uh, social media profiles, fake news, that kind of phishing style attacks. Um, uh, when I say the word accelerator, I guarantee you, you're all thinking about something and I guarantee you, you're all thinking about the wrong thing right now because we don't do that anymore. We're the third oldest accelerator after Y Combinator and Techstars and the model that you think of for an accelerator is very much a Techstars dream and model. Three months, sit your butt in a chair, speaker, pizza, beers, demo day, and oh, by the way, we gave you a 50 or 100 grand for six to 8% of the company. We don't do that anymore. We work with companies that are a little bit more mature. So they're at usually the post seed pre A round. Uh, I don't care if they've raised a seed round or not, right? I just care where they are. If they're leading up to an A round. They usually almost always have revenue, anywhere from 100 grand up to one, two, or $3 million annual recurring revenue. And the focus is on getting them customers. It's a hybrid part remote, part in-person program. And the in-person is actually on the road with us, bringing them into customers' offices, bringing them into investors' offices. Uh, we actually have a two-week investor roadshow at the end instead of a demo day, because if you're raising an A round, you're not gonna get there with angels. You need a real institutional. Um, sorry, I went a little bit long, but you know everything, I say accelerator and everyone just jumps to what we used to do. Uh, ben, actually, I want to tell you when I found out that I was on this program, uh, the senior program manager at Dream is like, Ben Gilbert, Acquired Podcast? Really? <laughs> like, and I said, like, I knew the name sounded familiar. And he's like, she's like, no, Google it. <laughs> so it's a great to find oh, cool. you in person. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. It's been, uh, it's funny. I, we started Acquired about the same time we started PSL. It's been kind of a fun three year journey yeah. from. You know, for the first year or six months, me being like, hey, friends, I'm like doing a podcast. And people are like, yeah, 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 we don't care. And now <laughs> you sort of have all these fun, uh, fun run-ins like this. Yeah, it takes, it takes for any of this stuff, like writing or podcast. And this is something I tell all of the founders. Like, it's going to feel like you're shouting into an empty room for a good year or 18 months. And then slowly it starts picking up and you start like, oh, I saw your podcast or you know, I read your article. And then slowly it builds its way up like speaking engagements or you know supporting your outbound marketing but the first year or two man it's like like ever, just ever it's like nothing's happening yeah yeah it's malcolm gladwell's dip so ben i want to i want to jump into what you were saying so you guys have done 120 startups and yet only gone forward with 10 and i think most people here listening have started a business and they kind of get that why does someone who focuses on for a living making awesome businesses only have a one in 10 hit rate? Yeah, you would think we'd be better since we do this all the time. I mean, I think the, the kind of industry wide stats are, you know, sort of 90% of startups fail in the first X months. Um, and the thing that we've gotten really good at is uh, there, there's places you can develop economies of scale and places that you can't. And anywhere where you're trying to evaluate uh, anything that gets close to product market fit is where it's really difficult to create economies of scale. On the other side, when you're looking at you know just very basic TAM or uh, kind of market research of what are the trends showing or um, what other startups have tried this before and died, like all that stuff you can kind of like knock out in a day or two uh, when you're evaluating an idea. But the stuff that gets into what segment are you addressing and is the segment of that market actually big enough to be venture scale? And can you hit that segment with a product offering that actually resonates enough for you to get reasonable conversion rates and reasonable cost to acquire a customer? That stuff always seems to take anywhere from sort of two weeks if you're, you're super scrappy and putting up fake landing pages and driving traffic to it. But sometimes if you're building a consumer product, you kind of need to know what the interaction model is a little bit. And that can take three, six, you know, hopefully not longer than six, but many months. And so I think that um, we're one thing we've learned is to try and be a little bit more judicious about, hey, when are we going to make a bet on something that we think actually requires a serious build out versus, hey, let's make three or four bets on things that we think we can kind of just concept test without doing any real building. But in either case, there's a lot more, um, you know, there, there's sort of a lot more uh, uncertainty around will people actually transact around this thing than you would think there is. 
So why focus on venture scale businesses versus focusing on cash flow businesses? Let's jump into that because that's the big that's the big divide. We got two guys on the venture side. We got Chad here who's bootstrapped two killer businesses, mm -hmm. and then we've got Coral that funds businesses that don't want to give up equity. Sure. So uh, we made a super conscious decision when we were starting that we are going for a portfolio of businesses with venture economics. I think we could have selected other things, but. Um, we sort of architected the entire PSL ecosystem around that, and that includes our capital structure. So we are an operating company. PSL Studio is an operating company that's raised money from 13 venture firms and 55 angels, and each of them only wrote you know, small checks relative to their, their, um, the size of the venture fund into PSL. So the main value proposition to them is, uh, hey, we're going to take your money and make great companies and, and we'll vet them uh, pretty heavily in creating them long before you ever see them. So you will sort of only see high quality companies from us. And so it would be, uh, we could probably produce good returns, uh, you know, a, a good return on the operating company just by creating cash flow businesses. But what our shareholders really want is for us to create investable opportunities for them. And so I think there's probably an opportunity to do sort of a cash flowing version of PSL, um, but it would be a little bit trickier to get the amount of capital up front um, in order to sort of align incentives to do that. And I think a lot of people try and do something like this with a consulting model. So half the business focused on services, half the business focused on creating cash flowing businesses, sort of like a, a product studio inside of a consulting firm, which um, which can work, but I think is often, uh, it's tricky to ignore the opportunity to go and chase revenue uh, and and sort of let your products atrophy. And so, I'll, yeah. Sorry, I was, I was gonna build on that and I really wanna hear what Chad has to say. So a couple of quick uh, points. So amen, we're also structured that way, so we just can't do it, right? When you're a venture fund, you can't do cash flow businesses, annuity businesses. Uh, number two, 100% right. If you're a consultant trying to do stuff on the side, you always get pulled away onto consulting work because that's money in the hand right now versus stuff that goes down the road. So that's a tough model to work. Um, I did look at, before Dream and I looked at doing a venture studio model for lead gen companies. Uh, which would have fit exactly in that thesis. Lead gen is great. You can spin it up, test it up in about three months, starts generating revenue really quickly. You can hire like the number two or number three man at a bigger, you know, a different company who's ready and hungry to do his or her own thing. So sourcing the talent, setting them up, you could have a common platform. Like the tech is not that hard. Uh, we came pretty close to pulling the trigger on that uh, and didn't do it because other opportunities came up. But it, it there are there is interesting white space out there for doing cash flow businesses um you know, and it's just not what i do uh it's, that's just not the way we're structured but chad listen I, I we've dominated the conversation i'd love to hear it from your perspective well I, I, first of all when you say venture economics and you say your hit rates one out of ten and i'm not saying you i'm i guess i'm referring to ben i'm wondering what that what does success look like to you uh from a venture economic perspective can you clarify yeah, absolutely. So we will spin something out when it sort of checks the sort of standard 10 boxes on the slide deck of we feel the market's big enough. Uh, so big enough being, um, you know, a $5 billion plus market where we feel like uh, the if we do a bottoms up financial analysis, there's a reasonable or, or there's a chance of getting to $100 million a year in revenue five to six years from now. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've done a lot of this sort of constructing to make you believe that we could move into those assumptions at some point. It's early stage modeling, you don't know, but that's kind of the, the initial sniff test. Um, so that's the, the that's a prerequisite, but then when, when we say that you have a one in 10 hit rate, and by the way, Babe Ruth had what, an eight, eight or 9% home run rate. I'm curious, like, so if that's the checklist of what you need to actually move forward with a business, have you actually built a business that reaches venture economics? And when I say venture economics, I actually refer to like a lottery ticket. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so we haven't yet. I mean, it's 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 three years in. I think uh, um, hopefully I'll be here in a year or two, and and we'll be able to have a different conversation. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, effectively you're right. We are spitting out lottery tickets, and they're sort of hopefully more well vetted lottery tickets than uh, than if we had just sort of spun them out when we came up with the idea. It, by the nature of killing the nine hopefully worse ones along the way, but um, yeah, 
What's your funding fall on rate, Ben? Uh, so far, 100%. Which so means essentially for any, for any VC, that's what you use for winning, is moving on to the next round. It might not be the correct way of measuring it, but it is generally <laughs> what VCs and accelerators are going it's to It's a leading use. indicator. Yeah. yeah. It, so hey, I, I want to clarify something, Chad, and I, I think, Ben, you tell me if I'm, if I'm stepping on your toes and putting words in your mouth, but it's a different stat that we're talking about here. Right. You know what, Ben, what you're trying to do is you're trying to decide, do you actually launch the company? It's the kind of thing that a good entrepreneur does before they fall in love with the idea and devote three, five years of their life to it. Um, the hit rate that you'll sometimes see, like you know, one in 10 or one in 20 are, are the big successes for VC. That's after they're launched. Right. So, you know, the stats that sometimes I'll see but when we were doing the um, when we were pre-seed focused, we had kind of a rule of thirds. A little under one third of our companies would fail to get the seed round, right? They'd fail fast. Uh, another, a little over a third, it was like 36, 37%. This is going back a couple of years. They would not only raise their seed round, but they go on to raise an A and a B round, which you know, in our book meant they'd already kind of hit escape velocity, so to speak. They could still die later, but you know they were well on their way. And then there was like a middle third that would kind of get up raise a seed, maybe an A, and then kind of stall, right? And then, you know, for a VC fund, it's like, well, what the heck do I do with those guys, right? Yeah. If they're dead, they're not in the portfolio, problem solved. If they're doing really great, they'll ultimately the exit, problem solved. But when you're in a venture fund and it's like 10 years into the fund and you're supposed to be closing the fund soon and you got a handful of companies that are just kind of going sideways, kicking off cash, um, you need to find a way to exit and that's kind of tough. Uh, the economics have changed a little bit now that we're one stage later, but you know when we're talking about a hit rate or a fail rate, I think it's kind of important. What Ben's doing is a different stage in the process. It's a different. It's more of a go no go decision. It's an incubator. Understood. Yeah. Which is yeah, it's, Andrew, it's, it's, you, you nailed it. We look at it like if we didn't spin it out, the company never got started. And I guess from a legal perspective, that is actually true because we never sort of paper the incorporation until yeah. we're like, yep, we feel good putting this in front of investors. Mm -hmm. So to add to that, since this is sponsored or designed by Coral, essentially there are a lot of those companies that have good economics, but not necessarily venture billion dollar plus type outcomes. Those companies can go to Coral.io if they're interested. We fund companies without taking any equity. It's non-dilutive, helps you grow quicker and faster. Enough of that though. I want to I wanna transition a little bit now into the different types of business models. So we've all seen a lot of different models. Chad's primarily on e-commerce and SaaS side of things. Ben's dancing around just about everything. And Andrew has his focuses, which are which are pretty lined in. So where are you guys seeing the best opportunities now for entrepreneurs? And what would you say is the next five to 10 years in terms of where we will see large scale venture returns, not necessarily exits, but successful businesses being built? And do, do you mean models or sectors? Uh, from let's do let's do both because models and sectors is slightly different, but both are interesting. I'll, I'll go first if you guys want to, you know, think for a few more minutes. Um, you know, so we start we start kind of with the macro level, right? So we start with the industries we want to play in, uh, and um, we kind of work our way backwards from there. So one of the reasons we went into urban tech, uh, first of all, we had an interesting opportunity come across our our plate, but we had four industries that we were looking at to launch, or four industry verticals we were looking at to launch. And as we kind of developed our theses around, you know, the market is big enough, uh, the customers are ready to move, you know, kind of at the big level, we started drilling down. And one of the other things we looked at was, was, the, was the venture market uh, ready? So we started crunching like the Matter Market and CB Insights data to see how many seed and A round uh, deals were being done to give us a sense of like, you know, are we at the right stage? Because, you know, like, there's, a, there's an expression, I wish I could remember who told me this. He's like, you know what the difference is between being too early and wrong? But not a damn thing, right? <laughs> you don't get any prizes for being right, but too early. Uh, and so when we looked at the different sectors, uh, it turned out that urban tech, as we defined it, uh, was within one percentage point of the activity in early stage venture that health was the year before we got into health. And we, that was exactly the right time to be in health tech. So for us, we start with the overall industry. We work our way down to like, our, you know, are the customers receptive? Because if you don't have customers, like nothing's happening for the startups. 
And then we started looking at the venture landscape because if I have great customers, usually I can get money, but it's a really uphill battle if every time you go to a VC, they're like, oh, we don't do construction, right? Or we don't do prop tech. So that's how we decided uh, to enter urban tech. We did a similar, uh, a similar exercise with secure tech, and that's why it's secure tech and not just cyber. Uh, then we had another overlay, which is how many other people are doing it, right? That's a, a part of it for us. Uh, and then lastly, we started drilling down into like, well, what's out there, right? What are the models that seem to work? You know, what is the, oh my God, it's another dating site equivalent for construction, right? Or real estate. You know, what are, you know, what are the stuff that customers really like? So we keep drilling down and then certain models came out of it. In our case, we're very heavily skewed towards B2B models. Uh, if you're industry driven, you tend to sell to the industry. Uh, you know, it might be a little different if we had gone into a retail focus or a hospitality focus. Uh, but when you're in construction, you're almost always dealing directly with large general contractors or developers. Real estate is predominantly a B2B play. There's some B2C, but most of what we see is B2B. Mm -hmm. I think you said you wanted to add something, Ben. Um... I don't have anything great to add, but I, I will sort of go next. Go yeah. for it. Um, I think, and I'm highly skewed from spending so much time with my podcast co-host, David Rosenthal, who's got a um, marketplace focused seed venture firm. I am like completely enamored with marketplace business models. Um, I've had the sort of good fortune of spending a bunch of time with the Rover team as that's gone from you know, a, a, a tiny little seed of an idea now to a, a billion dollar valuation startup. Um, and I, I love the, the um, just intense focus on uh, marketplace efficiency in those businesses. And if you really start to understand how can I serve one side and serve the other, once, once you really start to um, kind of develop a flywheel around, or I guess a natural flywheel develops by making one side easier, making the other side easier, making one side easier, making the other side easier. And you can get um, just like tremendous moat, tremendous uh, sort of additional value created for customers with you doing absolutely nothing um, on both sides of the business. And, um, you know, you look at some of the biggest companies started in the last 10 years and a, a lot of them are are marketplace models and i think the common wisdom is that a lot of people look down the sort of household spend and they look at auto and they look at home and they look at food um and you're like well there are companies that already exist for each of those that have marketplace models you know there's there's uber for transportation there's instacart for food there's um you know the airbnb for pseudo lodging. I think there may be something more in sort of permanent lodging from a marketplace business model perspective. But I think there's, you know, dozens of, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar marketplace model companies that are sort of still to, to, uh, to come about. So um, I think my last nine months or so has been uh, really a fascination with what other marketplace businesses can we create today that are sort of mobile geo uh, enabled. And I think a lot of things, one thing that a lot of people are looking at in frontier tech that I'm not totally sold on yet is sort of the AR, VR, mixed reality stuff. I see it, but I have no ability to time it. And I feel very similar with that world that I do to anything about crypto. Um, I wish I were maybe a smarter person or probably, uh, you know, I, I probably just need to spend a lot more time trying to understand the landscape. But I'd say um, sort of call me the... Um, call me like the old fart in the room, but like I, I, I uh, there isn't a frontier tech uh, category that I'm long on right now yet, and I may just be late to the party. But um, you know that that's I'm still looking at a lot of the sort of old school stuff. That's part of your business model as well, though, is you want to see the market that's proven. That was what I was about to just bring up. Is uh, the problem with some of those models of evaluating what a market size is or can be? I mean, Uber was black cabs. Airbnb was, hey, you want to want to come be a bum and sleep on my air mattress? There is that inherent challenge where you don't actually get it. And then generally speaking, the businesses that become something ridiculous, people don't get it. That's that's the whole point. 
Yeah, and I think we try and build that into our market sizing exercises. Like I'm, I'm working on one right now that I believe I know something that most people don't and that the all the current market sizing would tell you it's in the hundreds of millions, but I think there's a multi-billion dollar shadow market and I'm doing everything I can to prove that. But I, uh, um, you know, I, we try and build that in. We can be wrong, but um, I think mar if, if your market sizing activity is looking at research reports and looking at existing spend, it's, it's not the greatest market sizing activity. And then there's Chad who scratches his own itch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, uh, I was thinking to myself, like, when I started these businesses, did I even look at the total available market? Like the answer was no. I would just I saw for, like for the accessory market in e-commerce, I was like, oh, there's a lot of saturation for vacuum cleaners, probably more than IP addresses in the United States. All right, let's start making vacuum filters because these are way overpriced and the industry needs to be disrupted. And there's just way too many incumbents that are taking a far higher margin than they need to be. So uh <laughs> Uh, and then for Scubana, I mean, we yeah, we were we were bootstrapped, but we were also scratching another problem that I had and eating my own eating our own dog food. We were like, okay, I can't find a software that runs and automates my business all in one that's multi-channel that handles Amazon and Shopify and Jet and Home Depot all in one place. How can I just build that uh, in one system? So and then we started offering it commercially to others. But it's just interesting. It's just a different way to I think look at the world. <laughs> um, and I think we, we, I have a good lens as being like the end user uh, and seeing these problems firsthand and, and experiencing them and solving for those as they come up. Do you guys think the scratch your own itch generally leads to better entrepreneurs in that when you're building a business, it's going to be a roller coaster. You're going to get punched in the face and you have to keep getting up. If you're just doing it from an economics or let's evaluate an awesome market perspective, they really don't care. Uh, absolutely yes, but with the caveat that it doesn't necessarily have to be your own itch. It can be a place where you find passion. That's not necessarily a, pro a thing you experienced. Um, I, I, yeah, you absolutely are going to have horrific days and horrific weeks, and probably like month-long troughs of sorrow. And you have to figure out um, like if the what you're facing uh, walking into the office isn't going to keep you uh, excited, then the mission of the company has to. When do you pivot or change the business? So Go ahead. Let, me, let me jump in here. So first of all, I hate it when people steal my thunder. Damn, Ben. Um, so, the, so number one, yeah, like I've had a lot of companies come in ultimately and they said, well, I was building X and I realized that Y was hard and I had to build it for me. And now I don't do X anymore. Like one of our portfolio companies was selling like watches on campus to students and they wanted to create a, a student ambassador network. That was really hard and they built the student ambassador network and by the time they were done and they realized that all these corporates were willing to pay them for it they stopped selling watches they kind of stumbled into that other opportunity uh and there are a lot of people on you know who, who will get into the right opportunity sometimes um by chance i think in chad's case he just knew intuitively that the market was big enough he didn't have to run the numbers because it was just hitting him in the face um, so that's, uh, you know, that's a hundred percent the case when I'm looking at stuff, I tend to be a little more systematic. I like to check my math. I like to make sure I haven't, you know, you know, overlooked something, um, to Ben's point, like the phrase we use is we like people who are missionary, not mercenary, right? If you just said, oh, it's a great opportunity. I'm going to do this. Um, then when the going gets tough and somebody's offering you a nice cushy salary position somewhere else, you're like, no, oh, screw this. I've had enough, but, uh, you know, if you got into this business because your mom went in for radiology, you know, radio treatment, sorry, um, chemo or, or radiotherapy for uh, a tumor and you were getting your MD and you realized like the way they're deciding how much radiation and where to put it is really just, you know, guesswork and you're going to make something better. Like you're going to keep going even when 36, 46, 86 VCs have told you no. And you know all the cancer centers are like, no, come back to us later. You're going to keep plugging away at it. Uh, you know, and as for when's the right place to quit as a VC, never. Just kidding, because I <laughs> you know, persistence. If you keep going, you know, it's only in my best interest. But truly, um, you know, there is um, this is one great cartoon I saw. Right, and the difference between a successful entrepreneur and an unsuccessful one, and it's a picture of two entrepreneurs that have been digging a tunnel like trying to get to the other side and they're like this close to the end of the tunnel 
and one's still digging, the other one threw down a shovel and went home, right? Uh, the hard part is it feels that hard all the way until suddenly you break through. And there's no easy way to tell if your breakthrough is just around the corner or if it's still miles away. Um, so really, like, if you truly believe in something, you keep going into the bitter end and you just can't do it. Like, you can't make rent payments. Do not mortgage your house. Do not get a second mortgage on your house. There's always other ways to fund things, though. With uh, just If you have money. cash flow. If you have cash flow. If you don't, you're not ready for Coral. Oh, no, I wasn't even talking about Coral. I'm just talking yeah. about you see these guys on Shark Tank, and you know they're putting them on there. It's like when you watch American Idol, and you see the terrible singers, and they put them on there just because they're the poor suckers that everyone feels bad but kind of has to laugh a little bit. And you see people yeah. mortgaging their house for a business that's like, dude, why didn't you pivot? So when do you pivot? When do you diversify? When do you change the business? That's the next question. So pivots become like a fashionable word. Um, you know, we used to just call it trying something new. Uh, it's fine. I mean, you should be constantly trying something new. You should be constantly experimenting. Like everything that you do, you should design it if possible as an experiment. Like Ben started off, it's like, hey, you know, we're gonna validate the industry. Let's put a couple hundred bucks in, in AdWords and see what, what our customer acquisition cost is, right? You, everything should be designed with like, okay, it's success if. Right, and you can tell it. You do it. If it doesn't work, you move on. Try something new, right? And you should be thinking it through in advance, right? It shouldn't be like, well, that didn't work. What can I do next? You should really have a whole set of this is what I'm going to do in this order. And the lower down you go on that list, the lower the odds of success are. So obviously, you're trying the higher likelihood stuff soon at first, right? Otherwise, it's just stupid, right? Uh, and when you start getting kind of low into that list and you start thinking to yourself, well, these are Hail Marys, right? You know, these are the ones I never thought would work, but they're all that I have left. Like that, that's when you got to start thinking about maybe we need to do something very different or something, you know, just shut it down and move on. Mm -hmm. It's funny. So I, uh, for, for the last year I was running, um, one of our spin out companies, uh, taunt, which is in the esports space, sort of. Mm -hmm. inventing what fan engagement and competition looks like in, in esports and um you know there were there were lots of days where you come in and like the team morale might be like a little bit less than yesterday and you're trying to sort of suss out why and someone brings up like this sort of scary existential question of are we trying the right thing and mm -hmm. like then there's other days where like it's amazing and you're playing it and it's really fun and you're like of course this is going to change the world and so one sort of mantra that I, I like to think about when you're thinking about pivoting or changing something is, am I, if I were to sort of have to present a logical flow of why we are changing our minds on something, if it is based on, well, I feel this way now, I prob probably shouldn't do it. But if it's based on, we got into the space, we started operating and we learned this thing and this thing breaks our original thesis or uh, unlock this new piece of knowledge that we have about an other part of the industry that we should go after. It, pivot should be based on new concrete things that you learned rather than this is how the team feels emotionally right now. And I think that, um, you know, that was sort of a really clarifying moment for me on uh, how seriously to take it when we, I sort of look around the room and I'm like, oh, two or three people want to change direction right now. What should we do and how should we adopt you know, as a team, um, a shared mindset around that. I, I completely agree. If it was true yesterday, it's true today, unless something's changed. You got to point to what's changed. Mm -hmm. There's another good way to um, think about this that I, uh, um, so I'm on the board of that company with, with Brad Feld and Brad was on the board of Zynga and brings up this really great anecdote that at Zynga, one thing that they did sort of in all their teams were 80% uh, of people doing the, the core thing carve off 20% or less of people to go work on VNext. And there's gonna be like three to five VNexts before the actual VNext is the VNext. And you should always, even at the at earliest stages, let's say you have a five person team, like figure out how to allocate some small percentage. Maybe it's a, a half day a week, or maybe it's one person part time or something to like run and down sort of the next opportunity. Not so much that it applies serious drag to the main team, but sort of always to be available and open to what a new uh, um, a new offshoot could be. Mm -hmm. And that's a way to save yourself. It's almost like an insurance policy on a pivot because then you're not hard pivoting into something you know nothing about as a Hail Mary. You're mm -hmm. sort of pivoting into something that this person's been gathering data on in some way uh, for a, a serious amount of time now. 
Yeah, and by the way, that also helps a lot with morale because sometimes the we should try something new is just like you're just powering through the slow spots. So if they've got a little bit of their time where they're looking more at green fields, it makes it easier to get back and, and the other stuff. By the way, when my first startup, um, we actually had five shots on goal. We, so my first startup had to do with summer camp. So we'd come up with like five service lines that we thought summer camps would be interested in. Uh, and when I look at the list back, one of them was like photos of camp. Remember, this was 1999, 2000. That was actually hard to do. Uh, that played out. That's still the killer feature for a lot of them. Then we thought like supplies before camp. But we were totally damn wrong on that. Right. We were wrong on timing. We were wrong on everything on that. And then we had this other one where it was like messages that I could send from my computer that would be printed out at camp. And we just thought that was a freebie. I mean, it's like it's a web form, right? We can't charge for that. And I remember the CTO sticking his head into my office and saying, hey, do you think we could charge for bunk notes? And I'm like, I don't think so. Let's make it optional. See what happens. And like that first season, it was our, set, our number two revenue stream. So like the next meeting in September when the summer's over, like the CEO is like, we're definitely charging for bunk notes. So we had like all those other shots on goal and they were all light tests. Uh, and then when it turned out that one of them was really working, like all of a sudden, you know, okay, pull that up. Now it's, you know, not in the farm team anymore. It's in the, uh, mm -hmm. the major leagues. And when you're starting on, if you can do that, uh, give yourself a little bit of optionality without losing focus, that's great. And then there's having to run two businesses. Chad, you run two businesses. You've got to hire people. When do you hire people? How do you focus? Because that is something everyone struggles with. Now, real quick, I want to just mention on this trying things new. So we have 28 people at Scubana. Uh, we have a very, very small, I would say overwhelmed development team. And we don't really try things new. And we made a lot of mistakes by trying things new and having diverted focus. And so we'll have roadmap meetings where we, we actually sit down and we'll say, OK, we want to do this feature, great. Will this feature make us rich? And I think that's a great way to look at the world because we, we used to develop small features, solving small problems for a small port of, part of our SaaS application for Scubana. And it just led down uh, a long, long rabbit hole of small features that weren't going to actually increase our ARPU, our average revenue per user, and certainly weren't going to actually make us or our investors rich um, in the short term or the long term. So I think that's a great way to look at the world. And uh, we're doing that like every single time we have roadmap meeting, we'll say, does this make us rich? Does this apply to majority of the clients that are on our platform? And will they actually be using this feature? Uh, in terms of, what was that? It's 80-20. It's what do you focus on? You focus on the things that drive. Well, you could be focusing on things that actually prevent churn. Uh, you could be focusing on features. Uh, you could be focusing on maybe development features that maybe fortify your platform. Uh, but like we get so many feature requests on our platform. There's so many different use cases that we need to prioritize and triage them based on okay, how does it, how will this work with our stakeholders and how will this work making us rich? Right? I think it's just a great way to look at the world uh, from a SaaS perspective. In terms of uh, hiring. So I actually have these two businesses, and they're very, very different, right? E-commerce, you buy low, you sell high. In SaaS, you build, you sell, you build some more, you sell, and then you still have to manage an entire team of developers and manage the, the customers on the platform. And our platform isn't cheap. So uh, for, for e-commerce, uh, we built Stubana so that I can automate my e-commerce business, and we're actually down to one employee in the United States, and everything else is automated with technology. Uh, or outsourced remotely, which is very, very different than at Stubana. Uh, everybody is in New York, uh, developers, account managers, sales. Uh, it's super time intensive uh, and definitely a different caliber of, of people we're hiring on the SaaS side versus the e-commerce side. Uh, but one thing I want to note that's very similar between both businesses is that everybody at both businesses gets a VA. So some companies in Silicon Valley, they get holistic water or organic lunch uh, and we give out all of our to our, all of our employees we give them virtual assistance to help them actually accomplish their tasks and work on what they love talk about how you do that and how to be effective because i think this is something that silicon valley and funded startups have no clue on so are you talking about giving people vas or yeah and the best way to make that effective how do you essentially setting up an assistant uh, ea something for people okay so i mean that's a very long conversation but so I first start with myself. I think most entrepreneurs want to uh, 
do more when they get a virtual assistant. And for me, I was like, how can I get things off my plate? So subtraction was a lot better than addition in this case. Uh, and so I went through my, my hustle, my daily grind for two weeks with a, a Gmail calendar, documenting where am I spending my time and seeing what do I like to do? What do I hate to do? What do I suck at? Have a bucket list and have a bucket list. Um, I think it's really important. Then doing that for other, for all my employees. So I would sit down and be like, okay, I want you to, for two weeks, just write down everything that you're doing. And then write down, what do you like to do? What do you hate to do? Have your bucket list, have your effort list, have it all in one place. And then let's review after two weeks. And what happens after that is like magical. So you sit down with the employee and you, you identify all the areas that they're wasting their time and they're inefficient or things that they hate doing. And I think this is what Ben said earlier is you want to work on things that you're passionate about and that's where you're going to have the most success. So you double down on those areas that you like doing that you're successful at and then outsource these automate uh, these repetitive low value mundane tasks to a virtual assistant. Hmm. Ben, Andrew, do you see anyone doing something similar? Yeah, the one company that I've heard doing something similar, um, and I have a, just a ton of admiration for the CEO of this company and for a lot of their other policies and practices too. I think they're very innovative. Is um, Assist and Shane Mack is the CEO of, of Assist, and uh, they they just have a um, a tremendous focus on employee equity, um, not in the ownership sense, but in the equality sense, and uh, and really making an incredibly inclusive, welcoming culture for everyone. And one of the the things that Shane believes is that pretty much every perk has a bias toward sort of um, the dominant culture in startups of sort of skewing younger, skewing male. And in some way, you know, like a, a, a silly example is the ping pong table is likely to be used more by, by the 23 year old single man than by the 45 year old uh, mom who's going to pick up her kids. Like she's probably not going to spend time hanging out from five to seven playing ping pong, drinking beer. And so uh, they basically slashed every perk at assist and instead just give everyone access to an EA. And uh, Shane's perspective is, I don't know if it's cash neutral or not. It probably comes close, but the advantage that we get from all, all feeling like we're in the same um, the same boat and everyone's valued and respected, not to mention the productivity gains, as as you're talking about, um, is is you know uh, is is completely game changing from a sort of employee morale and culture perspective, but it's also an incredible recruiting boon to be able to talk about that and really differentiate your company across every other startup that's pitching, pitching that they're gonna change the world. So it's, it's interesting, I'm, a, I'm the wrong guy to ask here. Like I've never actually had a, uh, a uh, an assistant. Like I'll still book all my own appointments just because my calendar is so weird and it's you know, sometimes I need buffers for travel time, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I really want the meetings, sometimes I don't. <laughs> Use Calendly. Uh, use Calendly. You're wasting your time. No, you I've tried right. Calendly. Calendly has fucked up my calendar so badly, so many times. I've uh, booked over things. I don't know why, and I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, why. But uh, it's also because it's very unpredictable. Like I, When Calendly works for me, or if I'm going to a conference, and I know I'm going to be in one place for like six hours, I want to book back-to-back -back meetings. So that's great, but I don't have like a standing point in time when I'm in the office, my, my schedule is just too variable to use that to say like, hey, pick any time you want. Uh, also, there's there's two different types of times for me. There's uh, uh, creative time and, and executive time. So you know, executive times are like short meetings, like phone calls. Uh, you can bang them out one after the other. There's no switching cost. Creative time is when I'm really trying to come up with something new. I'm trying to draft new material uh you know for an article or when i'm trying to draft uh you know a, a new deck for internally for my team or i'm trying, trying to come up with a new product and there i really need one or two or ideally three hours of uninterrupted time where i can just focus um and i you know i, I just calendly interrupts that flow so I, I can't get my creative time but i didn't mean to go super detailed what i mean is that, like i've never just taken advantage of that like if i sit down and go through my week there's not a lot of stuff I can put off to um, a virtual assistant, but I have had the good fortune of having really great program managers, mm -hmm. uh, including Sarah, who, who you know knew Ben. And there is uh, there is nothing like the feeling of knowing that 
you can give a relatively high level task, right? It's not like, you know, schedule appointments for me. It's like dealing with clients and then just hand it off and knowing it'll get done, knowing that you don't have to follow up with this person, knowing that it'll get, it'll be done uh, well enough, maybe even as good as you'll do it and maybe even better in some cases. Like it just disappears from your mind. That's like buying time. So that's awesome. And what percentage of your time do you spend doing emails right now? <laughs> Probably 30 to 40%. I right, have an interesting thing. Everyone pull out your phones. I know mm -hmm. this is not indicative uh, because most of our email, serious email is on your computer, but go to open up your, if you have an iPhone, go to settings, battery, and then uh, and under battery usage, you can see last seven days, the mm -hmm. um, percent, if you hit the little clock, you can see the number of hours that it was on screen. What's your number one app and how many hours on your phone were you using it? So first of all, I end up spending most of my, my emails from my phone anyway, because I'll dictate them. Ah. So this is actually like a lot of my time. Um, uh, but now I'm on an Android, so I have to go figure out where that is. <laughs> um, yeah, 29% uh, phone, 12% Slack, 11% Chrome. Wow, phone's your number one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I do a lot of part of the phone. least used app on my phone. It really dep yeah, it depends on where you are. Use WhatsApp if you're not in the US. In the US, they kind of suckered you into getting unlimited calls. <laughs> it's true. Oh, wow. This is totally, um, on, wait, I'm, oh, this is maybe the last hour or two. Sorry, like like Google Play and, and Nike Run Club are coming up way at the top of my list, and I don't run that much. <laughs> Maybe it's I'll like go figure out or something. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, but... I'm pretty good about shutting these these things down, but uh, I'll figure it out. I think it's just for the past day. It's an interesting my, exercise. I'll go check that out. Yeah, my number one always, and like by a fa uh, by two uh, x whatever the number two is, is mail, and it's been like two and a half hours uh, on screen in the last mm -hmm. week on my phone. And the funny thing about that is like, I won't, I won't do serious mail on my phone. Even, even with your point around dictating, I think I end up dictating a lot of things. There's mm -hmm. like a, uh, if there's a, even if I'm writing a short response to a long mail, I kind of like somehow need it on my screen to be able to mentally wrap my head around all the content and feel like I'm, I'm creating the appropriate response to that thing. If it's I'm, I'm also a bit of a uh, perfectionist that way. So I'll dictate it. <laughs> And then I go over it again because, oh my God, speech and text can screw up pretty royally sometimes. <laughs> it's gotten very good, especially on the Android. Um, so Matt you, knows this. I, am, I speak often on outsourcing virtual assistants, automation, mm -hmm. and like I outsource my inbox and I rarely check it anymore. Um, I have this flag, I have a flag and tab system. My, wow. VA, my VAs, I have two personal VAs in the Philippines and they draft emails for me. I approve them. We have a flag tab system on the left. I can show you guys offline on how I do this, uh, and it works amazing. So I, I do something like that with wow. Sarah. Um, I, I, I don't know if I would trust a VA for a lot of my work. Maybe I, maybe I should think about it. But a lot of the times when we're reaching out to you know, our different corporate partners or different startups, or, and I've got a lot of them going out, Sarah will, I give her permission to enter my email, she'll actually draft the emails and leave them in my drafts. Nice. And then I'll just go over it and I might add a sentence on the front end, you know, something a little huh. bit more personal for people that I know a different way. So that's huh. a huge time saver. But like I, it's a, I'm, to get that level of trust took a while. So you're a brave man, Chad. Chad, that would be a great lead magnet for Skubana. You make a video of you going through your email. This is how, <laughs> I, this is how I outsource my email and Skubana is how you outsource e-commerce. I'll make one suggestion since we're getting down to productivity tools. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of auto uh, autocomplete. So way back in the day when people still used Microsoft Word, there was auto text and autocomplete. You could type like three or four letters and it would pre-fill whole paragraphs. I hacked together like a shitty CRM for like a 20 person customer service team all around that document template around the common answers to email questions. And I still do it today on Chrome. There's a plugin. I'm sure there's tons of them. The one I do is called Auto Text Expander for Google Chrome. I, I yeah. use that as well. Oh, that's cool. I thought I was the only one that found it. And I've got like large blocks of text that are pre-programmed. What I don't have 
is something like that for mobile. And I've looked really hard. And the irony is it works on the subject line, but it doesn't work in the body of the email. So if any of you have that equivalent to that for mobile, I would love it. Yeah, it's great for URLs, email addresses. Also, HubSpot, you can use a free account. HubSpot has, has snippets also. I do like how these things always turn into productivity conversations because it's like the the group of people is usually people that are more protective of their time than you know their and than anything else in their life. Yeah, and it usually happens forty five minutes into the conversation and it's, <laughs> it's trading out. So we're right on schedule. Right. We are right on schedule. Is there anything else that you guys think that businesses that are listening need to know? If you wanted to leave entrepreneurs with one thing, I'll let each of you leave people with one thing. What would it be and why? Is there a way to source any Q&A? Uh, Matt, can we kind of find yeah. out if anybody's wondering anything? There is. The problem is it looks like it's just one guy who keeps posting and he's talking about his vacuum cleaner and other things. <laughs> there doesn't appear to be any valuable Q&A worth discussing. I could right, be. Cool. Yeah, I so could I'll, be wrong. I'll go first. It, it may not be the most uh, valuable piece of advice, but it's, it has the virtue of being the one that comes to top of mind. And it's consistent with what we've been saying. Um, the only thing you can't get more of is time, right? It, it is a finite resource and it will kill all businesses, right? Uh, so anything you can do to buy time or create time, like you raise money, that gives you a little bit more time to prove you have a product market fit. You hire the right people, that gives you a little bit more time to do the important stuff. Um, but if you get into that mindset that like every time the clock ticks, you know, oxygen is leaving your tank and you constantly ask yourself, you know, is what I'm doing now really important, uh, really necessary? Is it the best use of my time? Like, that's really the entrepreneur's mindset. Like, uh, so I can leave you with something. I'm sure Ben and Chad will come up with something a little better because I just bought them, you know, 30 seconds of time to think of something more, more impressive. Go ahead, go ahead, Ben. Why don't you take another 30 seconds so I can one up you? Perfect. I'll give you the gift of time. <laughs> um, you know, co coming off of the CEO experience, I think at least sort of for a first time CEO, you transition from a world where there were lots of high important things in your life, uh, in your work life. There, you probably, if you're running a company previously, were a hard worker. So you were you know, working on, on the weekends and lots of times when other people weren't working um, and you're more productive than most people. But when you switch into running a company, there's a different thing that happens that is, uh, there is always a hair on fire problem. There's, there's multiple, like constantly. And uh, each of them left unattended will kill the business. And the sort of mental box that that creates around you is kind of mind blowing going through it for the first time of how could I possibly go to go to sleep? I'm the long pole on this thing that has to get done. I'm in the critical path. Uh, it's the most important thing to the company and I'm holding it up by not answering this, you know, coming to a conclusion so that people can work on it in the morning. Um, I, I must do that right now. And I think uh, my sort of advice for for founders and advice for myself for the next time around is to sort of remember to breathe because I think it's very easy to get suffocated by that and uh, and fragmenting your attention across too many of those and uh, it, it makes you it runs the risk of making you a bad leader and and someone that people don't want to be around and I think one thing that is important is always remember that, you know, you hired your team for a reason. And even though it feels like every problem is rolling up to you, figure out a way to sort of empower people to own domains so that, um, um, you know, it's it's not always absolutely on you. And, uh, um, and some things will fall on the floor and that has to be okay because uh, companies have succeeded with lots of things falling on the floor before. And even though it may not feel that way, breathe and remember, remember it is that way. I heard, a, I heard a podcast with Reed Hoffman. He was saying something to the effect of, in uh, the early days of LinkedIn, they were getting something like 100,000 uh, 100, customer complaints on a specific thing every single week or something to that effect. And he's like, until it reached the point where it was going to bankrupt and take down the company, we just didn't care. We just told our customer service reps, don't answer this. 
We'll get to it eventually. And it's kind of like that. Chad, do you have any good any good podcasts or chats on these type of topics? Because I know you do a lot with this. And you, I mean, you have an eight-figure business with two uh, people. <laughs> well, optically, yes. You know, it's very, very hard to manage, to be frank with you. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to my podcast. So I, I'm just looking at my podcast list right now. So this morning, I drove into the city, and I was listening to Noah Kagan's podcast. Uh, but then I'll have like Masters of Scale with Reed Hoffman. I meant once you've been on where you've discussed your system in depth. Oh, oh. Um, like plug I yourself those, now. <laughs> those are e-commerce podcasts. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see here. I'll have to get back to you on the exact podcast I've been on. There's been so many. Uh, but we do tons of webinars. That's actually a big part of our growth is that we do we do webinars with other adjacent uh, companies in our space that are non-competitive. And if they have a similar demographic and similar customer profile that we do, essentially they send it out to their list, we send it out to our list, and then uh, we both lead, we have that lead share list that we can nurture over time. Um, and then podcasting, I mean, look, we're growing organically right now because we've been able to teach. And I think that's the other important thing I probably would wanna impart with others that are listening today, is that if you have a POV and you've been there, done that, or if you just actually teach, you're building a different relationship with your customers or you're building an audience. Uh, and I would highly suggest people, like right now, our model is flipped. We don't spend any money on any PPC. We don't do any paid advertising. And maybe we should. Uh, and that's why we're going to our Series A right now. But right now, everything that happens at our company is all organic. Uh, and I think that's an amazing position to be in. And so just be a thought leader, be unique. Uh, and like a company that I think is doing really well with that right now would be like someone like Basecamp. Um, he's doing a great job. I think Noah Kagan's doing a really good job at it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my wisdom for today. Awesome. Now it's time to tell people where's the best place to find you and connect. Uh, yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Chad Rubin. You can find me at on email. Of course, you'll hear from my VA in a response. It's <laughs> chad at cubana.com. Uh, and you can connect me on Instagram or anywhere else, and I'm happy to to freestyle and spit all ideas together. Okay, I'll jump in. Uh, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter, but the best way is to just email me. Uh, I'm I'm Andrew at DreamIt.com. I do get to all my emails eventually. It may be an hour, it may be ten days, uh, but I do get to them all. The one thing that I ask is if you do reach out to me, make a very clear why. Um, you know, I get a lot of like, Hey, I, you know, we have a lot of people in common in our network. Let's link. Like I, now I have to think like why we should link. Don't, don't make me think. Right. I use that a lot. I don't remember who said that, but it's, it's definitely a meme. Uh, if you want to reach out to me because you've got something like, Hey, I'm the head of innovation at a you know large construction company. I know you're running urban tech. I'd like to see what kind of startups you got. Or I've got a great startup in the real estate space that I, I think is post seed and you know got revenue. I think we're in your strike zone. Like lay it out for me, so I know exactly what you want. Like, don't be shy, don't be coy, don't tease me. Like I don't have a lot of functioning brain cells left. I drank a lot when I was younger, so just like make it real easy for me. Oh, and last pet peeve, clear subject lines, right? Just, just put it in the subject line too. If it's like intro or it's blank, that goes way down to like the last email I answer. So, you know, would like to talk to you about great dream at startups for my company, or I've got a great urban tech startup for you. Oh, and then the name of your company. Cool. Um, I'm on Twitter at Gilbert. Um, Acquired.fm is where you can find the podcast um, or search acquired in any of your, any podcast player. Um, if you want to start a Pacific Northwest based company, uh, or you're already working on one and, and want to get involved with Pioneer Square Labs, either on the venture or the, the studio side, um, PSL.com and, uh, would love to chat about any of that. And if you guys are building businesses and want to fund them without giving up any equity, board seats, control, all that, that and the other, coral.io. If you guys are interested in this, you sub subscribe to the podcast. You can just hit that subscribe button. And if you're interested more on the, the funding side of things, building interesting businesses, the syndicate.vc podcast I run on early stage investing, and fringe.fm. It's like the TED Talks, but longer form so that we can cover more topics. Hopefully this has been fun, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for coming on, guys. This has been fun. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.
And I need to steal that strategy that you have, Chad, because there's too many emails. Just email me. I will. I will email. <laughs> you. Very clever. Very clever. But um, we'll talk to you later, guys. Cheers. Bye.